May I have your attention, please? All passengers with tickets for flight two now departing at gate two for Woody's Sound Machine. <laughs> Welcome inside the Paris C Palace Hive of 3773's Broadway. This is a live edition of the Jake Feinberg Show, comedy on Power Talk. Please go to our website, powertalk.live. Download our free app to your smartphone so you can stream all of our live local programming, including Solomon on Blast, the Jim Parisi Show, and yours truly, the Jake Feinberg Show. We can't thank you enough for making us part of your day today. And Without further ado, I want to bring in a, in a tremendous per, uh, percussionist and trap set drummer, um, a guy who's uh, kind of uh, flown below the radar, but uh, he was part of these Razor's Edge lab bands that were coming up with uh, this intoxicating mix of blues and jazz and rock, which uh, in court, you know, which kind of led into a, a genre of music that wasn't really being called funk, but then it came, became funk. Um, this cat uh, was part of uh, quite a few big band units, including Woody Herman. We just heard him coming in there uh, doing Flying Easy with Donny Hathaway at Cadet Records. And he's dedicated his life to rhythm. And heading into my ninth year on the radio, uh, I've recognized that rhythm is love. And, um, and that's what will continue to heal and hopefully heal the world uh, amidst a lot of insanity. Ed Sof, welcome to the Jake Feinberg Show. Hey. Hey, thanks, Jake. Hey, it's great to have you, man. You know, I just want you to riff on this for a minute. I, I, I'm 41. I, I um, was a late bloomer as it related to music, but uh, I collect a lot of records. And, you know, rhythm was this huge, round, bouncing ball when you were coming up. It was this just pulsating grooves uh you know you had bass players like peacock and lafaro and leroy vinegar and drummers like donald duck bailey and all sorts of cats who were just like increasing musical vocabulary or setting the table for it with this round rhythm and today we're in this uh and i i want to make make it clear i hate labels but as it relates to pop music rhythm has become so quantized and and electra and um, you know, with digitized rhythm with electronic beats, it's become quanta. It's mm-hmm. become it's very, very up and down, mm-hmm. very linear. It's not just hard for dancing, but it makes for incredibly inauthentic rhythm because, as you know, every drummer, everybody has their own internal heart, internal time feel. And I want to talk to you about how you think that's affected vocabulary in music. Gee, what a simple subject. <laughs> Welcome to the Jake Feinberg Show. I mean, without a doubt, how people connect with music and going back to listening to field recordings of of African drumming troops, the, the Roosevelt Expedition, many, many, many years ago, and you hear the ground rhythms, people literally people stamping their feet on the ground, and the, the offbeat rhythms, higher notes being done with hand claps or sticks. So the, the whole idea of, of, of a groove built upon 
a ground rhythm or a bass drum or what a kick rhythm, if you wish to call it that. And a backbeat is is ancient, is truly ancient. And um, it t- it's taken many, many different forms over the years. And it, but from my standpoint, there are two basic versions of this beat and one of them is non-syncopated which is way a lot of the of the uh, quantized rhythm as you call it is is happening today uh, it's very very up and down and then there are also the syncopated rhythms which are i think more to what you're referring to with funk and basically dance rhythms right. people connecting through the through the music, through dance rhythms, and this 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 is most apparent. I mean, and especially in American music or jazz, American jazz, and there is no other, as far as I'm concerned. Right, is started it in New Orleans. So, <laughs> you know, all the things, that, the cats that you mentioned in your introduction were all children of New Orleans, not meaning geographically. But that's where the rhythmic roots of the music have come from. And the, the influence of technology and the lack of humanity in rhythm, which we hear now, is just pretty much part and parcel of what's happening throughout our lives, I feel, because of the influence of technology, whether it's what they call surveillance capitalism, the things like the Amazon and Facebook wow. and that, that's wow. the thing. Wow, this is you're going, you're going to the core right now. I mean, I, this is what is surveillance capitalism? Surveillance capitalism is is well, let's put it this way: capitalism that was based before upon manufacturing, hmm. industrialization, hmm. etc., hmm. is now entered a digital realm, and this realm consists of giant corporations like Amazon and Google and Facebook uh, that, that are manufacturing not products, but manufacturing and collecting, forget manufacturing, they collecting personal information, our information, the information they get from our clicks, from our choices, from our searches, to create information which they sell to retailers, maybe even to the government. Who knows? I'm not going to go there because I'm not a conspiracy theorist. Sure. But they, they are, instead of mining coal, they are mining us. And we get nothing in return. Absolutely nothing. We, we, we have signed our rights away in this respect. So surveillance capitalism is basically we are, every time we use our cell phones, we are being surveilled. Every time we do a Google search, we are being surveilled, and all of what, of what we're doing is being recorded and kept and archived and put into data forms that can be sold to other entities who can figure out, yeah, this guy buys this kind of sneaker, this lady likes this kind of makeup, these parents buy this or that for their kids. And so then all of a sudden you start getting pop-ups on your computer and on your phone, you're going, how in the hell did they know that? But they, it's, it's, you ever hear of a cat who, uh, oh man, the guy who rang the bell, Pavlov? Oh yeah, sure, you know? sure, sure, yeah. Yeah, or, or B.F. Skinner. Yeah, who, yeah, who, yeah, dig, dig, yeah. yeah. His ex- well, that's what's happening with us, basically. They, we, we are, they, we have been figured out, our, our insecurities, our wants, our, our dedication to instant gratification, is all being used to, for other people to make money off of us, and this is what this is what surveillance capitalism is about. There's a great, great, great book on it. Uh, I recommend everybody take a look at it because it'll give you an idea of how our lives are being transformed without us even knowing it. And Go ahead. I'm no, I, you know, Ed, I think what you're saying has tremendous validity to it. And I know you're just getting hip to me. I, I would say that um, we are past the industrial age. We don't manufacture things anymore. There's a lot of things that you said that are true. 
I have mm-hmm. a, a big problem with this idea of, uh, well, for instance, I just sent you a friend request on Facebook, and I understand that people have a really big problem with Facebook because mainly, and here's the deal, as a rogue journalist, somebody who's, um, who, you know, what I, what I do is take a, a, an excerpt like you just riffed on so eloquently, um, I'll put up a little heading, Surveillance Capitalism, and uh, put a mm-hmm. picture picture of you up, and that thing will fly all over the place and inspire. What I'm trying to get at is that if you're a receiver of information, uh, or you are, are you or you're hooked into the spiritual capitalism of our culture, then you're going to drown. But if you're a producer of content, I have never found a better medium for driving consciousness than Facebook. My first book was just birthed. I'm not sure if I sent you a link or not. I've connected with all the cats. I don't care who we're talking. I mean, every all the the, the old guard because of mm-hmm. Facebook. I've 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 disseminated the information through audio through the, through my through these interviews through audio, recognizing that not everybody's going to be listening or doesn't want to listen. They want to they want to read it, so I transcribe it. So I look at it and I say it's really on the. It's on the, the individual person themselves to be a seeker. I mean, as it relates to music, I mean, it, we are saturated with, with music on YouTube today. So if you're going to find Ed Sof playing his ass off, you're going to be looking at heavy exposure with Phil Upchurch and Richard Evans and all these badasses. Now, again, I'm in a niche. I'm in a really, you know, sort of insane sort of pocket, but... It's really about whether you're going to be a producer or a receiver of information. And if you have content, and most importantly, quality content, then you're going to inspire a lot of people to be themselves. And I think that that's what the long-term goal of some of these forums are, as opposed to what you're talking about, which most people use it as sort of, they're like, what is the point of this? I'm just scrolling through and receiving information, and I'm getting these pop-ups. Well, then don't buy the damn shoes. Don't buy the house. I mean, like, think for well, yourself, of you know? Of course, but the pro- but the, the point is, is that we, get, we, sign, we have signed our rights away to privacy by doing this people know more people know that these people who are collecting this information have, have stolen our privacy i mean as it relates it's, to i i guess i'm just not everything i'm not that hung up on, i mean listen unless i knock on wood i don't want anybody to be taken advantage of by um predatory uh, people that steal their fortunes or their money um but i i just i'm not that hung up on 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 I don't have that much to hide. I don't have anything to hide. You know? Well, of course, but that doesn't that doesn't mean that there, that there aren't questionable activities going on. That's true. I mean, I mean, listen, you know, yeah. and this is not Ed. So, for I mean, we're talking. I mean, we've gotten going into the deep well of philosophy and sociology here, and we are definitely in uncharted waters and very dangerous times. There's no doubt about that. Um, yeah, for sure. And I think that there's a lot of validity to what you just talked about. But, you know, I mean, I just, I, I really, you know, I remember talk. I did an interview with George Porter from The Meters, and he was talking to me about a lot of early recordings in jazz, especially. Um, the bass drum was not prevalent at all in the recordings themselves. In fact, most of the uh, recording was the top part of the kit, and... If you really listen back, um, uh, Bill Cosby, I did two interviews with him before the world caved in on him about his involvement in music, and he would talk about putting on a blindfold, and he could tell you right away if it was Mickey Roker or Pete LaRocca or Max Roach or, you know, whoever it was. And I have a, I want, uh, I sure. want, I wanted Ed Sof to talk about how you learned to use um, the top of the kit uh, to, uh, to, to keep time and maybe... Uh, using the 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 bass drum, people say dropping bombs, but I'm talking more about accents and rebound. To me, that's the most intoxicating thing about melodic improvisation. Some people would call that jazz. But did, did, were you you were steeped in using the top of the kit as opposed to just pulsating bass drums? Right. And the reason why the bass drums were not recorded in the early days is because the vibrations from the bass drum would knock the needle off the wax. <laughs> Disc, really? Disc. Really? Yeah. Holy cow! It was, it was all cow. a technological problem. Yeah. So that's, that's so why cool. We heard recordings of Baby Dodds and Zooty Singleton and those cats in the early days. Of Tiny Con. Basically, heard. 
No, Tiny's Tiny's a, a bit later. Right. Tiny was the the um, the early the early stuff. The first drummer who had a ba- his loud his bass drum to be recorded, but when they had the technology to do it, was Krupa. The, the, whether that's true, that's anecdotally what it is. But the early Cats, it was all all wood blocks, tim tams, snare drum, cymbals. Oh. Because if they if if they had the bass drum, it would completely screw up the recording prospect. Okay, now on to the other thing. Well, hold on. I just want to be, I want to make sure I'm clear on this. The, the 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 recording was being done on what kind of apparatus? Where on a f- disc? There was there was a. If you go back and look at do some jazz history research yeah. uh, in some of the early book, bo- in some of the books they show say a picture of, G- of so and so's band recording at the Jeanette Studios and you'll see the guys in a half circle in front of what looks like a big megaphone and that that, that was the, the first primitive microphone they played and the sound went in into the, this megaphone like affair cone like a cone and behind that was a machine that had a disc on a turntable with a needle. And the disc was either shellac or wax. I don't remember. But at any rate, this was how the master recording was made. Wow. And if, and if that, for some reason, the bass drum, if played, make the needle bounce because <laughs> of the of reverberation. This is wait, so, so you're telling. I'm going to be clear because this is this is so fa- This is really kind of really beautiful information. You're telling me that that the entire ensemble, whether it was a quartet, quintet, would all get in a circle to get. So the drums were right next to the to the megaphone as well. The drums are probably the furthest. I don't know. If you, if you listen to my dad collected seventy eight, sure seventy eight jazz. So on some records you could. You could hear the drums more clearly. Others, you couldn't. I mean, I really don't know if there was a set protocol for how the band set up. But the pictures that I've seen, the horns are in a half circle, and the rhythm section, the piano is usually closer, a banjo and bass, if there is one, right. or tuba, uh, is closer. And the drums were usually behind the, the, uh, the horn line. This is so cool. So basically, there was a, a shellac, whatever it was. It wasn't um, the master recording was being pressed on vinyl, and the bass drum, the the vibration. No, no, this is, this is way before vinyl. This is this is the early twenties. Wow. Yeah. So it it's, it it was shellac because they uh, they they used hell whatever it was yeah. they used it to press. The future recordings. It was like the die for all for the future recordings. It was the die. So you would say it was a circular disc of some sort. Oh yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it was circular, and and before that, it was a a wax cylinder. Going more. Edison's first Edison's first recording machine. I mean, I'm talking more like. I don't know. I hear I hear like these like Stan Getz albums and Kenny Clark's playing, and it's like. By the fifties, uh, well, who? Oh, the shit was 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 locked in in the fifties. That was all the new technology. I mean, I'm t- I'm talking about the the the, the birthdays of recording. Man, you're stretching me out. I mean, when, when they how did they lock the technology in by the fifties? Because all I'm saying is that it's you know what I'm getting at is that today, uh, just in modern music. Uh, I mean, there's no dynamics in a lot of ways, and the bass drums are just pounding you in the face. And it was not oh, like, sure. you know, and, and I, I just, it was very tasteful. And I'm just trying to, I mean, it, when, when the bass drum, when they did figure out how not to ruin the recording with, who was the first cats that you got off on that were using the bass drum for rebound and, and, for, and, and, for, and for, you know, accents? Well, uh the first per hear clearly uh, were the drummers who played continued to play four on the floor, but accented notes within the four. So a good drummer, just to, for a little technical thing here, when when a drummer played the bass drum on all four beats, he usually and 
early, especially in the earlier days, he used a, a lamb's wool beater, which gave a very diffuse sound. It wasn't like hitting it with a wooden beater or a hard felt beater. And plus they had calf heads, which brought a whole different dynamic and sound to the drum. Hmm. So what, what the drummers would do, and there's some, uh, some later pictures of Krupa, uh, especially he would, he would play the bass drum on all four beats softer with his heel down and then he would accent notes within that by bringing his heel up and using his whole leg to, to make a bigger stroke to make a louder sound and buddy rich did this too so those were the f- first cats that that i've really heard live at jazz at the philharmonic when i was a kid and of course as a like a, every other drummer you watch everything they do and I noticed that they could keep four on the floor, but they could get away from that to play syncopated patterns and then come back or to catch a band figure and then come back to the four. So that's how that was my introduction to that. And then there, I, I would read in books about how Kenny Clark was the first drummer to quit playing four on the floor and to use it as like he would his left hand to play non-repetitive comping figures. And I say, OK, I'm going to check that out. I could I could never really figure out what he was doing until I met Ed Thigpen, oh. who was a gr- great great jazz drummer. And Ed um, Ed and I became good friends. I'm and very very honored by that. And he had seen Kenny Clark live, and I, I and one day we were talking, and he said, just I don't know how it came up. He says, you know, one thing that really really makes me angry. I said, what's that? He says. These guys who write these jazz history books and come out with these ridiculous statements. He says the one that kills me is that Kenny Clark revolutionized jazz drumming because he quit playing the bass drum on all four beats. And and Ed said, that is absolutely false. He said he played soft four on the floor and accented within that. Same way Max Roach did. Same way Blakey did. So there was a great misconception that all of a sudden everybody thought, oh, wow, man, Everybody's done with four on the floor. I've got some recordings of Tony Williams with Miles. Or if, you bat, if you've got a good amplifier and can, and can switch channels on it, you can hear him playing soft four on the bass drum. I've heard Elvin play soft four on the bass drum. So, I mean, that is the kind of BS that, has, that distracts people from, from really listening to and thinking deeply about the music. It's a stereotypical judgment which has absolutely no background or basis historically. Ed Soph is on fire right now. I mean, this is really... So are you saying that... I forget how you articulated it so beautifully, but, uh, you know, at at least at the superficial, stereotypical level, Kluke was given Uh uh, credit for not playing syncopated four on the floor. He was playing uh, off the, you know, different accents. But was there somebody... yeah. yeah. No, he he quit he he quit playing four on the floor. Period. In other words, if he the bass drum didn't play unless it was a, a some sort of accent or syncopated pattern, like like the snare. You know, it's you got to start on this history. It's well, again, it's this the, is uh, listen. I want to be very clear, Ed. It's at forty one. In, for my radio show, this is about promotion for my daughters and future generations and their understanding of rhythm. So there's nothing promotion uh-huh. about this. This is important. I'm just trying to get at the fact oh, that I know. I'm, I'm just trying to get at the idea of saying what did Thigpen, did Kluke get credit for something that he actually didn't do? Exactly. And and wow. uh, I don't even know if if Kluke would consider it to be a cre- be credited. I mean, well, of course it, not. It was all these journalists like me writing this shit up, you know. Yeah. So I, the uh, there were there's so many stereo. I can I can I can criticize academics because I used to be one, and in that I I had a university tenured university position. So I I know I know academics, and I, I also have a background as a player, as someone who basically learned how to play drums on the street. Not in a in a university. Oh, I setting. love it. I, you were so, a street, you were a street scholar, yeah. You know, it's the idea that the only part of the kit that keeps time is that which is repetitive. Hmm. You know, oh, your bass drum's a timekeeper because it's going boom, 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 boom. Oh no, the ride symbol's a timekeeper because it goes ding, 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 a ding. Ride pattern can be whatever you want it to be. Hi hat on two and four, that's the timekeeper. No, the drummer's the timekeeper. 
And whether or not something is repetitive or not is not because of some academic dictum, but because the style of the music demands four on the floor or doesn't demand four on the floor, demands a two and four hi-hat or does not demand a two and four hi-hat. For Christ's sake, if we thought in those stereotypical terms, we'd still be playing like they played drums in the 1920s. Exactly. So, you know? Yeah. So the drums are, are one of the most misunderstood instruments, um, and, that, and a lot of that has come from people writing about it who don't know what the hell they're talking about. Well, I've, I've, basically what I, what I do is instead of writing my own theses, I just transcribe what you guys are talking about. And I've gotten so much great information from so many of the, well, sure. you know, and, and I think that that's much more effective. I mean, because a lot of people would say journalists are just frustrated musicians. I'm, I'm, I, I mean, I felt that I play, you know, with a couple of surrogate uncles and I felt that four-way coordination and that magic, uh, that transcendent, transcendent quality. But, you know, I, I like the fact that the drummer is the timekeeper. It's not one specific part of the trap set. But I just, I, I, I look back on it and I, and I ask Ed Sof, um, not that I'm turning on NPR every night, and I know that they run jazz every night, but, you know, what's really vexing for me is that going back to the Cosby analogy is that <clears throat> at least with drummers I, I, w in today's music there's a homogenization of sound I can't tell who right. anybody is and I'm wondering yeah, you're not supposed to. <laughs> uh, well well uh, the, the the thing Glenn Moore from Oregon you know he said before mono and went mm -hmm. to stereo you you know with you, you were prided on the, you were respected you were supposed to be able to recognize somebody within the first eight bars of a solo. Um, mm -hmm. and, and so that to me was intoxicating. Individuality was, was absolutely, um, uh, you know, considered to be the Holy grail, uh, Garibaldi, David Garibaldi is a dear friend. And he told me that, you know, when cats would come up to him at the on Broadway and Jack London square and said, Oh man, yeah, you just sounded just like so-and-so he'd want to slit his wrists. And now I can't mm. tell who anybody is because they all sound, you know, they, they wind up sounding like their professor. I wonder if, you know, you talk about the, the pedagogy of academia. Um, how did you um, work with your students so that they sounded like themselves? I gave them basic technical tools so that they knew how to get a good sound out of the instrument, knew how to play dynamically and could play at a variety of tempos in a musical way. All my students got the same tools. They all sound different. It's the same way a person who, if a person's a painter, they're told how to make colors, how to mix colors, how to mix paints to get different shades, but then they take it and everybody uses that knowledge in a different way. Not everybody paints red fire trucks, you know what I mean? <laughs> so it, it, it's very, very simple. As a teacher, you think to yourself, what are, what are the prime musical tools that this person needs to have to be able to learn how to express their own musical, their own musical feelings and expression? What tools can I give this person to, so that they can unlock their own musical imagination? What tools can I give this person that will give them the self-confidence to try to express their musical imagination. And that's the whole point. The idea is, God forbid, that your students play the way you do. Your, the, the point is, is to go back into your own past and think about why you got fired from this gig, why you got fired from that gig, why you got on that recording date, why you didn't get on that recording date. Figure out all those obstacles that one has to overcome not only musically, but socially, too, and psychologically. Think about your own past and put yourself in the shoes of your students. Find out what they don't know. Uh, giving them the confidence not to be afraid to ask questions, uh, which is as silly as that sounds, but... Kids today, the way a lot of them are taught in secondary school, it's 
there's no dialogue between teacher and student. It's either right right answer or wrong answer. Right. But at any rate, that's 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 just it. And being a teacher is the greatest responsibility in the world. The greatest responsibility in the world. Unbelievable. You have a at North Texas I would have a, a person for four years. Not just for one semester, you know, not just knowing them th- through their bubble tests, filling in the bubble. I mean, actually dealing with a human being and establish a rela- establishing a relationship for four years. Man, that's deep. That is deep. And I don't think a lot of people realize that. You are responsible for so much. This person has come to you to lay the groundwork for a career, for their life, for Christ's sake. Deep, really deep. But at any rate. No, I mean, this is absolutely, I mean, did you, I mean, is it something that um, authentically, is? was there anything that could, could be correlated from how you, I mean, being a drummer on the street, that's like, Moondog. I mean, that's like Tony Scott and Moondog playing on. I mean, this was like, I mean, how could you, how could you applicable, make anything applicable to how you learned to play to, especially with the live gigs? I mean, I don't know. I mean, Billy Harper, I've interviewed and John Wilmoth and, you know, all these cats that went to North. Oh, my old buddies. Yeah, they're all great cats. And I mean, I've interviewed all these cats Uh and. Uh, you know, they were, I mean, they, there were these college jazz competitions and not only that, there was like places to play, go, you know, uh, you know, Gene Perla and Mark Levine, these guys were playing salsa bands and while they were going to Berkeley yeah. School of Music. And it's like, how, how in the heck do you, not that you're trying to te- to be like, oh, this is, you know, but I mean, isn't it hard to teach somebody when you, the way you learn to develop your you know, uh, of course not. Right. No. So, I mean, no. I, that's the, the, to me, it's the disconnect. I mean, you know, Kenny Burrell told me, he's like, you know, our jam sessions are in the student union at UCLA now. I mean, before you were getting kicked off the bandstand by Lou Donaldson, if you couldn't play a, a, a shuffle, I mean, it was just a little, it was just, uh, explain how you, I'm curious about this street scholar self mentality. Can you talk a little bit about setting up a modified yeah, trap well, set on the street? What this, yeah, what this is, is what you're talking about is, is the loss of mentorship. Right. And by this, I mean when, when, I, when I was 15 years old, I somehow got a gig playing with older bebop musicians. Probably the one that if anybody recognized the name, it would be an alto player named Jimmy Ford, who was who had a group with Red Rodney back mm. in the 50s. Mm. Jimmy, was, Jimmy was called the White Bird. He also played with Maynard Ferguson. An incredible, incredible alto player who had come back to Houston, where I grew up, to get his life back together. And I'll be damned if I, my dad took me over there one afternoon to an afternoon jam session that they had, and the drummer, who was a very kind man named David Berry, came over to me and he said, Eddie, would you like to sit in? And I said, oh, man, I don't think so. I just want to sit and listen. And my father said, yeah, you know, you better go sit in or you can forget about playing drums. <laughs> this is it. So I went up and played. And long story short, I ended up playing the whole set because I'd get up to go and the guys would say, oh, no, man, come on, play another tune with us. Come on. So I ended up getting the gig because Dave Barry was leaving town. So all through my high school years, I was playing five, six nights a week playing bebop with guys who were, could have been my father. And some of them were, were I mean, they were, they were so supportive. They turn around and say, what in the hell are you doing back there? Man, I can't even hear myself. Hmm. Or Jesus Christ, he said, the guy would turn around and say, you realize you rushed the tempo so bad that we couldn't play the head on the tune going out? And I did. I mean, but I, I was lucky because I got a second chance. And, and it, so by the time I got to North Texas, men and women, I was way ahead of everybody else. On top of that, I had such a, a, 
a great knowledge of the music because my dad, we, he'd come home from work and they wouldn't turn on the TV. They'd put on Louis Armstrong or Sidney Bechet. And I, then one day he came home with Charlie Parker record. And I go, ooh, what is that? And he said, that's Charlie Parker. And I said, oh, I don't like that. Put Louis Armstrong back on. You know, but he kept bringing bringing stuff home. And then one one evening, who should come into our dining room but Thelonious Monk was on the record. So by the time I got to North Texas, man, I was educated. Not because somebody said read Chapter Six in this history of jazz, but because my head was full of the sounds. My eyes weren't full of the words, and that was the key. That's what I realized. You learn by listening. Well, you just nailed it because I, I, this is what I wanted to ask you about is um, uh, I think you just broke it down is that uh, I'm not sure if you were an autodidact, but the point is that your generation came up learning by ear and modern generations yep. are coming up learning by sight reading before. So their ears are locked. And that's bit that's really uh, you the, got it. Yeah, that's it. Well, I've, you know, we got a game on this program called Name That Tune. Talking about just an amazing drummer and a guy who's able to articulate concepts that are not easy in this time, but let's put this on and come back and break it down.
Music on the Jake Feinberg Show, brought to you by Abbott Taylor Jewelers, Butch Diggs, and Dr. Diggs Dental, and Craig Pretzinger of Allstate <laughs> Insurance, and uh, just can't thank him enough so we can play tunes like that for a legend, Ed Sof. What do you got for us, Ed? What What do you mean? Well, what, 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 was that what, 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 what tune was, what, 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 what was that? Do you have any idea? I have no idea. Oh, that is beautiful. This was... Um, the title track off um, an album on Muse from 1977, Walter Bishop Jr.'s Soul Village. Ed Sof, oh Mark Egan, God. Steve Kahn, Nywood, Brecker. I mean, this is just and and and, and this is the point. Um, it's a burning, <laughs> it's a it's a burning, burning album. But but this is what I wanted you to focus on. Um, <laughs> I was at Billy Cobham's Art of the Rhythm section in Mesa uh, last summer. Um, he held, he hold, he didn't hold hold one this this 2019, but he had Kenny Barron and Ron Carter come out for a Ooh, night. Oh boy! And um, it was so magical because I was uh, doing some Facebook Live um, of their sound check and hear all these texts running around like, oh, uh, uh, Kenny, do do you need this? Do you need this louder? Or Billy, do you, you know, they're, they're, they're yibbing and yabbering and, you know, verbal, communicating in English, very European style communication. And Uh out of all the questions, none of them were answered. The guys did not say a word. They just, Kenny started to play a little bit of uh, a piano and Ron Carter started to play a little bass and, Within about two or three minutes, all the texts had disappeared. And the point is that, and then, and then after they were done, they were able to let them know if they needed, you know, their, this raised or this volume raised. But the point is that the, in, the, in the truest form of jazz, the African-American tradition, it was just playing. There were no, it was just the, the feel. It was... Well, the ultimate, you know, we, we know that the language of the drum in particular, I mean, that had its own language going back to the motherland. And I wanted you to talk about your experiences, um, you know, because, I mean, Thelonious Monk, I mean, I mean, these guys were not playing with charts. I mean, this was just like hit it and burn. Um, and, and you really played by ear. And I wanted you to talk about um, your experiences playing, well, like, you know, people like Walter, you know, playing in, with the, in, in the true African-American art form of, of jazz. Well, um, I don't, that's sort of a, a, a broad question. Um, let me put it like this and I'll just, I, I mean, mean when, like when, Gene Page. No, let me, yeah. Let me, let yeah, go let riff. Me put yeah. it like this. Yeah. I, I, I define jazz as, as improvisation. And uh, that, that to me is what the root of the music is. And there are forms of jazz where, where uh, in the improvisational aspect is not evenly distributed in the group uh, or minimized, such as in the record you just played, because there was no melody, per se, for me to interact with when I played. I was basically interacting with the form of the tune. Right. It was a modal tune. It really was not a. I don't. I. I. It's amazing. I don't remember the, even even the record. It's been so long. Ed, ago. you were cooking I the. Remember. I mean, this whole record is burning. Modal. I mean, it's like late seventies picture of Walter Bishop somewhere in Harlem. I mean. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. yeah I, I, I remember. I remember the cats on the on the date and everything, but I just never really. Anyway, yeah. the point is is. <laughs> In a situation like that, number one, right. uh, you rehearse before you record. I mean, there's nothing. There's nothing in this case, at least, imp- that was uh, spontaneous, other than what happened with the soloist, right? and that which is as it should be. Right. But running the tune, get, giving everybody a chance to get comfortable with the form, with the feel, with the tempo. Maybe uh, the uh, the blueprint of who's going to do what, where, solo order, and all that. All that all that goes into the mix. Then, on the other hand, you have people like Mr. Cobham and Mr. Carter and Mr. Barron who can sit down <laughs> and play. And you think, my God, these guys have been playing together. 
that just sounds so good and so perfect. So both situations, especially the second situation, number one, depends upon experience, how much you've played, what you know to listen for, your own self-confidence level. Because as we know, the music is only as strong or as good as the weakest link in the chain. Hmm. So when you got when you got folks like Cobham and Carter and Barron, there are no weak links there. So that's the 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 the, the trust between the three gentlemen. They all trust one another. They know that if something gets funny, that somebody else will fix it in the band. If the time were to get turned around, which is highly doubtful in that in that trio, but if something like that happened, adjustments would immediately be made. In other words, all three of these gentlemen are up there for one purpose, to serve the music, not to serve themselves. So I saw a great example of this. Chick Corea came to town a number of years ago, and the band was Chick, Christian McBride, and Steve Gadd. They had never played together before. <laughs> and Chick made, a, Chick made a point of saying out front, he said, you know, we've played in various combinations together, but we've never played as this trio before. Right, right. And, he's, and he said, now, keep that in mind, because the first tune's going to be okay, but the second tune's going to be better, and the third tune is going to knock your socks off. <laughs> because we'll have, those, we'll have those three tunes. We'll have that time to to recalibrate our 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 ears and and our, our you know our right work it out yeah totally just to get 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 comfortable with the room and the whole routine. And my God, Jake, it was unbelievable. <laughs> it's just exactly what happened. Once they hit that third tune, shit, it was never Neverland. It was just unbelievable. <laughs> This is what I'm talking. No, this is this is the overarching um, point. Is that I want you to riff on this. Is that uh, you know, uh, I remember talking to the late great and Dugu Chancellor, and and you know, Ham Paws would, you know, he he'd be like, huh. he'd, he'd be like, damn man, he's like, you know, we we're we're talking about all this shit. We haven't even played one note. And I just, to me, jazz is is it's not. A, I know you want to do a little bit of. Uh, you know, in my mind, the R word is a little bit of a dirty word, rehearsal. But I understand for the need for tempo, get people comfortable. But, you know, uh, Hampton's Halls is like, freak, we haven't played one note. We've been intellectualizing the music. And that, to me, jazz is a primal, tension and release, uh, pulse-driven music that you don't want to necessarily have it sloppy. But it's okay to go off the rails as long as you come back on. And have we gotten to a point where the classicalization of jazz has over has has become you know too much i mean do we intellectualize the music too much i mean it, it, I, you know carter baron and 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 carter those cats were cooking the groove on on records in 67 66 before they joined uh before billy and joined uh horta silver so i to me it's like there's a trust but what do you feel about the intel, intellectualization of the music i mean jazz to me is visceral, primal music. That's the music that your dad was bringing yeah, home. Well, okay, but that my big red light stereotypical judgment just came on. Again. Go ahead, yeah. Okay, yeah. because the, uh, these, this, this idea uh, that, that especially older black players, that it was just, just you know, they, they just felt it and all, that, all, the, all right, those other right. cliches. Yeah, don't no, demystify these this. Guys, Please these demystify. Guys, these guys studied the music. Right. They, for Christ's sake, Charlie Parker studied Bartok and Stravinsky. Sure. And what Char Charlie Parker said, man, you learn your scales, you practice your scales, you do this, and when you get on the bandstand, you forget them. The idea being that you internalize all the foundational material. You internalize the physical aspect of being able to play in time, in tune. You internalize the idea of being able to use space realizing that improvisation is not just sound, it's also how you use silence. You practice all that stuff. Practicing is individual rehearsing. And everybody who can play well has put in, God only knows how many hours of intellectualization, as you wish to call it. Because that's just part of it, just like learning how to mix those paints. And then whatever happens, this is the thing that you can't, Nobody knows how it happens, thank God. 
musical expression that every individual has, and somehow the, all that intellectualization allows that musicality, that personality, that emotionality, that passion, the sadness, everything to be expressed. So there are some people who play, you could say, in a very intellectual manner. John Lewis, the pianist with the MJQ, used to be accused of playing academically. Interesting. All right? Yeah. Bullshit. Bullshit. He's playing the way. He's right. The no, way he's playing. Himself. Himself. Yeah, I dig. I know this is brilliant. To, yeah. Who are, we, who are we to judge that? Who are we to judge well, that? You know, let's uh, let's not. You know, I mean, look at my. You know, I, I mean, these journalists are getting pummeled. I mean, they also said that. You know, Coltrane's music was hate music. Eddie Henderson said that people would get up and and walk out and tell them to make him stop. I mean, it was. Even the word jazz itself, Big Black told me that that it was jazz. Oh, it was J A S S. But then that, you know, this is, I guess you know, I guess it just comes down to, I'm talking about my generation as a Gen Xer and younger. There is so much literature. There's the Pat Martino book. There's the Dave Weckl book. There, there's so much material now. Whereas opposed to before, Mark Levine would walk into Jackie Byard's apartment. Through ear, Jackie would sit on the drum kit. He'd say, let's play Cherokee in all 12 keys. Levine would fall apart in D, and they'd say, okay, that's it. Mm -hmm. And you know what you need to work on for next week. See you later. The point is that people's ears were huge so that you could take stuff, yeah. you could learn, and, and now it's a visual. We are just saturated with material, and younger cats, unless they are truly seekers, they're at a disadvantage because they're not on the bandstand. And if they are on the bandstand, everything is mic'd absolutely. You know, we have so much more to get to, Ed. I mean, we, can, we, can we do part two? I mean, we're just getting cooking here. Yeah, one, one, one thing about what you just said. Yeah. Um, the, 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 the other aspect of this great deluge of learning material, books, all that stuff, uh, part of that is due to the fact that a lot of guys need to supplement their incomes because the playing scene is so bad. So they try to share their information, which is fine. Uh, reading a book of T.S. Eliot's poetry is not going to make the reader a poet. And obviously <laughs> learning, Pat Martino's, learning Pat Martino's guitar method is not going to make them a great guitarist. It's, that, that, I mean, that's, that's immaterial. The, the, the thing is, is that there are no standards anymore. My dog can make a recording. In, in earlier times, right. if you got on a record date, whether it was as a sideman or, or heaven help us, you were the leader, <laughs> that was like a stamp of approval. That was like, man, you have arrived. And that was a, an important aspect of the industry. That was something that everybody strove for, was to get good enough to be recorded, good enough to have an album, good enough to get a recording contract. Man, that was it. That was like having your paintings hung in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. That's all gone. No, you know what? You know, uh, Spinoza told me that, and it's in my first book. You know, you, uh, in order to get something recorded, it actually had to be really good. And today you can record anything. No shit. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's just like, you know, you know so, if, I mean, you are, I mean, I knew this was going to be an epic hang, but I mean, you, uh, the, you were able, friend, do me a favor. I know you hate Facebook, but. Accept my request because I mean I'm gonna. This is gonna be enlightenment and wisdom for so many peeps. Some of this stuff is just brilliant that you waxed poetic on today, and uh, and we'll do an, we'll do part two. I'm go, I'm off to New York next week, but let's do part two uh, real soon because we got a lot more to cover. Right, and I I really appreciate you taking the time. Well, I really appreciate having somebody to talk to. <laughs> yeah, man, I've been doing this for a minute, you know, but yeah, it's. Uh, it's cool, man. I'm. Uh, hey, go check out that that Walter B Bishop record, man. It's smoking hot. I will. I have to go back down memory lane. <laughs> <laughs> All right, man. We'll be in touch, and I'll get a copy of this out to you later today. Okay, man. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ed. Have a good day, man. You too. Bye bye. 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 Two interviews in the book. We'll be back with historian Deb Schwartz right after this. Thank you.